Um, as we've seen over the last few weeks, from individual Facebook feeds to you know, widely viewed events with the stars of the musical firmament, in a time of crisis, people turn to the arts to maintain their resilience as individuals, as communities, and as societies. Music, in short, is not a luxury, but a necessity. So I'm going to be talking here primarily from a UK perspective, but one of the things that I've learned looking at different cities uh, and the tensions that exist within them uh, is that there are often echoes, resonances uh, between them. So even if the terminology varies and the organizations vary, uh, a lot of the challenges will be broadly similar. And I'm talking, uh, I guess, in broad brush strokes here. Music cities share some key factors, uh, including not least their relationships to uh, state or regional or national governments. One of the sort of concepts underpinning uh, the live music exchange work is the idea of a live music ecology. In any given city, you need venues of different sizes to, you know, the pipeline uh, from, a bit, you know, people were talking in the last panel about the research and development um, of grassroots venues. Uh, people aren't, people don't emerge playing stadiums. You need from the grassroots to the mid-size uh, and so forth up to uh, the enormous domes, as it, as it were. But there are national ecologies too. Um, from the UK, from uh, local city authorities to uh, devolved government to Westminster, just as elsewhere, there'll be cities, state, uh, and federal governments. And one of the points about the ecology, uh, the idea of an ecology is that it's not just music makers that are part of it, uh, it's policy makers and all, all the other actors in a city. Um, so before I get to the, the big, big changes in the future, um, I'll just note some uh, current challenges that are going to shape, that, that if they're not addressed, are going to shape uh, that future in a pretty negative way in, in the UK. Uh, one of those is rent and tenancies. Um, Thus far, a lot of the, the help that this, this was mentioned previously, uh, but a lot of the help that's existed has been for big businesses, uh, but grassroots venues, pubs, cafes, everywhere that puts music on are shut, forcibly shut. No money coming in, um, but still often liable uh, for their rent. Um, so that needs to be dealt with. Um, to make sure that there are still venues to go to on the other side of, of all this. And the other point in terms of um, government responses to different types of business um, is big insurance companies. A lot of venues uh, took out insurance uh, for the type of event that we're seeing now and are struggling uh, to get it to pay out. Uh, so that's something that, that, you know, will need to be addressed as uh, legal action brewing from the Nighttime Industry Association. Um, and uh, those are sort of immediate problems, but there's also um, something bubbling under, rising up the ladder, um, is that planning and licensing and other issues uh, that venues faced before COVID-19 aren't going to disappear. So we have venues shut down because of COVID-19, but planning applications going ahead and even leaving aside the problem of getting false readings from noise reports and planning, there's a severe risk of local authorities not considering the nighttime economy. Uh, it was a long effort uh, in the UK to uh, move towards the agent of change principle um, and even beyond the very present danger of venues going under finance, uh, going under financially due to the lockdown, uh, there are longer range questions of how planning and licensing keep the spaces available for live music in what could be a protracted period of curtailed activity. Um, Self-evidently, there are problems with touring. Um, and in terms of music cities, uh, one central plank of many music cities strategies and actually major city economies in general is tourism. 
domestic tourists and inbound tourists from other countries. Uh, the total in the UK, 2018, was about 2.8 billion in spending for music tourists, domestic and, um, and inbound. Um, now, clearly, both of these are going to be truncated. And the knock-on impact for cities due to festival cancellations as well will be immense. South by Southwest, obviously. Edinburgh, where I live, will suffer due to the cancellation of its festivals. These generate uh, around 500 million in direct spend with multiplier effects of an extra 560 million um, for Edinburgh and Scotland as a whole. So that is something quite significant. These underlying problems are just going to be exacerbated. I'll add as well um, another underlying problem that we've got here in the UK and also in Europe uh, is Brexit. Um, the idea that um, a the idea that we will be able to negotiate uh, a satisfactory arrangement by the end of the year, which is currently still the stated government uh, government policy, is uh, frankly um, unrealistic. Um, so, ongoing challenges; those are the, the kind of immediate underlying challenges. Ongoing uh, is again kind of obviously a pivot to, div to digital. Right now musicians worldwide are demonstrating their creativity on digital platforms, sustaining us all. Uh, so one brief conjecture here, live digital consumption uh, could well become more heavily embedded in the fan experience, a core part of the experience, not just something to drive ticket sales or streams, more of an end in itself, an event in itself. But part of the challenges for individual acts will be monetizing that. Digital has not hitherto been characterized by the relative scarcity that accrues value. How to turn that around might be one issue. From a city perspective, as well as more generally, home digital consumption, even en masse, is atomized in a way that gatherings of people just are not. Uh, whether that be 30 people in a tiny venue all the way up to thousands or tens of thousands in arenas or stadiums. Relatedly, people can appeal directly and are appealing directly to consumers or audience members for digital streams. But again, we need to think about how this can feed through to bricks and mortar if that becomes a norm. Venues are obviously not just valuable as musical and social spaces, though very obviously they are that too. Um, the conglomeration of people in one place and at one time has been vital to city cultures and city economies. The bus and train tickets, the hotel nights, the sandwiches and meals, the pints of beer. And this applies across the live music ecology from the tiny grassroots venue up to the arenas. Now, we've seen some fantastic efforts in the digital, digital sphere uh, and a few that point directly uh, towards localities. So, for instance, Frank Turner working with the Music Venues Trust to save the joiners in Southampton via a live stream fundraiser and moving on to other venues now as well here. Um, but and I think this is really important. And this is, I guess, one of my key points. It can't be left to individual musicians and charities and organizations like Live DMA and the MVT. That is not a long-term sustainable model. And this is where a broader pivot, a bigger pivot that I want to talk about comes in. One thing that the UK Live Music Census revealed and that we've seen from comparative, uh, comparable exercises in Melbourne and elsewhere is that even if not all cities have the infrastructure, population base or commercial means to compete as music cities uh, on the world stage, they share some key characteristics. Decisions that feed musical activity, their effects are comparable across location, planning, education, licensing, support. They're all part of broader national systems as central policies feed through to the local. If there's anything that we've learned from the footage of people jamming and singing along with each other from their balconies, it's that whatever the situation, people will make music. Now we could be looking at 2021 before major stadium events return, and even if smaller scale activities can start up before that, it's far from certain how consistent that will be. Will there be a second wave necessitating further rolling lockdowns on a semi-rolling basis, 
and there's, there's, these are going to differ across cities and across countries. Beyond that, what, what works for some kinds of music is trickier for others. Maybe a concert hall can space its seating. What about a mosh pit, for instance? And this is really the, the key of that bigger pivot. The UK has seen an expansion of the role of the state uh, that was frankly unimaginable uh, a matter of weeks ago. With benefits extended to furloughed worker and credit, we're told, more or less on tap for businesses to keep the pulse beating while the economy is in the freezer. For many, it's still not enough. The self-employed had to wait for help and are still struggling. And of course, they make up a huge proportion of the musical workforce. Beyond that, local councils are on the brink of insolvency with over a billion pounds worth of funding required to keep them functioning. But this big pivot is the growth of the public sector. Now, a lot of what I said seems like doom and gloom, and obviously the situation is perilous. But I want to end on a slightly more optimistic note. As I've said, people make music, whatever the situation. Professor Simon Frith, who was one of the founders of the Live Music Exchange, amongst much else, noted in an address to the European Music Council in 2013 that a music industry does not create a music culture. Rather, a music culture leads to the development of a music industry. If there's one thing we've seen from the past few weeks, and indeed the previous panel of work that Live DMA, the Music Venues Trust and others are doing, it's the capacity for music makers and businesses and their organizations to come together. As I suggested at the outset, I'm hesitant to make hard and fast predictions given current levels of uncertainty. There have been a lot of comparisons in the UK with the Second World War. I am very far from convinced that they're entirely helpful. That said, the roots of our current arts funding infrastructure in Britain, such as they are, derived from that period. The forerunners of our Arts Council was the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, founded during World War II to maintain culture and morale. Following this, the first chair of the Arts Council was John Maynard Keynes, maintaining that support even in post-war austerity as part of the post-war settlement uh, was important. Now, in times of crisis, industries, citizens and enterprises are all more likely to turn to the state for support. So support for the arts isn't just special pleading. It'll be important for maintaining not just individual livelihoods, but those too, but our wider cultural infrastructure for wider benefits. It's long been said, and there's a bit of a cliche, that there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, likewise, everyone's a bit of a Keynesian in a crisis. Music sector in the UK has been operating close to crisis mode at grassroots level for a while now, but as we've seen, is well placed to make its voice heard. As political scientist Harold Laswell put it, policy is about who gets what, when and how. Everything is up in the air at the moment, so the opportunity exists and it won't be easy to shape the relationship of the state to culture as things reform to ensure that policymakers acknowledge culture as central to our cities, see it as a long-term investment, not just as a short-term rescue or charity, though that is obviously needed as well. City policymakers have to do that in relation to regional and national government, and individuals need to demonstrate that cities need their musical lives and musical economies. Music cities are cities first of all, and cultural policy is inextricable from economic or social policy more generally. If there's an overarching change, then perhaps it's the opportunity to drive this home. Uh, and I think I'm out of time, so thank you.